mainstream media gives you the impression that there is nothing good about America. In direct contrast to that, my podcasts will prove by examples that America has always been and still is the land of opportunity for everyone. Hello and welcome to another episode of Life Lessons with Dr. Bob. My guest today is James O'Keefe, the founder, CEO, and chairman of Project Veritas. If you've been watching the news lately on any channel, then you know something about him, and today you're going to learn a lot more. James is an investigative journalist, but in the 433,000 words that Wikipedia uses on his page, they don't refer to him as that even once. Instead, Wikipedia uses the disparaging term provocateur. Now, to me, that sounds like a French word, and since I failed French in high school, I had to look it up. The definition of provocateur is a person who associates with suspected persons, who pretends to have sympathy with their aims, and incites them to perform or say something incriminating. Indeed, James acts as a provocateur, but only in his role as an investigative journalist. In addition to being an investigative journalist, James is also an entrepreneur. Over the past 11 years, he has built a large and successful enterprise called Project Veritas. And for those of you who, of those of you who don't know Latin, Veritas means truth. The organization is staffed with people that he trains to use undercover methods, primarily hidden cameras and microphones, to achieve PV's mission, which is to achieve a more ethical and transparent society by investigating and exposing corruption, dishonesty, waste, and other misconduct in both public and private institutions. In simple terms, their mission is to uncover the truth. James, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Bob. That was quite an introduction. Well, how did it start? I understand, look, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, there was a profession in America for what you are now doing. It was called muckraking, and the people in that profession were called muckrakers. So how did a nice kid who grew up with a normal family in New Jersey, who became an Eagle Scout, who graduated high school and college. How did this nice kid became become a muckraker? Well, that's quite a question with a long story behind it, but- um, We're prepared. Um, I did grow up in New Jersey. I did have two very well-balanced parents. I think that's important to start there because I was re- I think I was raised well. But um, I think it's important to get a little into my upbringing. Um, uh, my father was a carpenter, engineer, my mo- mother a physical therapist. And I grew up in a, I would say, lower middle class background initially. And uh, my father was a carpenter. He would work on homes and restoring homes. And, and uh, he bought a very dilapidated house in the late 80s. And I was four or five years, started working with him, working on this house. Uh, it was just the, the dirtiest conditions imaginable. I'm working with him and my grandfather to fix up this house. And it wasn't for investment purposes. It was to live in. He wanted to rent out part of this house. He, it was a, it was a, a carriage house from 1890 or thereabouts. And, and it had a main dwelling. And he wanted to turn it into a multifamily house because he wanted to make an income by living in the house and renting it out. And that's where he started when he was in his late 30s, my age with me, then four years old. So I began to work with him and my grandfather and I didn't like it, but I was forced to do it. Uh, everything, you know, painting, you know, wallboard, you know, roofing, you know, mowing the lawn as a very young man. And I did that throughout my adolescent life. Um, once my dad finished this house, it was such an impressive achievement that the state of New Jersey gave him an award for renovating this century old home. It had a carriage house, it was it was quite beautiful. And my grandfather, a product of the depression, um, salvaged materials off the side of the road. They were very thrifty, industrious, enterprising people. I was raised by 
effectively my father and my grandfather doing this work. When I was 10 years old, my dad decided to buy another house with the with the uh, money he earned from the rent from the first. And, and same thing, it was a dilapidated house. We fixed that up. About two years after we finished, or I'm sorry, it took us two years to finish the house, um, the tenant put a mattress next to the furnace mm-hmm. and the house pretty much almost burned down. And everyone said, just like they said about the first house, there's no way you're going to be able to fix this house. This is, might as well condemn it. And my grandfather, who lived with my father, um, we went back to work fixing this house all over again. Mm. Mm. And I spent the next year of my life scraping old fire, you know, the, the char off the walls with my fingernails. It was dirty, disgusting, and I hated it. But I tell you this story because I think I did not know until recently, um, maybe the last couple of years of my life, just how unique and how special my parents are. I thought, well, everyone had this upbringing. When I was doing going through this, I thought this is just the way the world is. But I think my father really taught me the importance of resilience mm-hmm. and the importance of hard work. My mother was a very balanced, is, they're still married, a very balanced and forgiving and patient person and, and very reasonable. And for that reason, I was raised with these values. And around the time I turned, you know, teenager, 16, 17, 18, I started observing the media. I started watching local news. I was from New Jersey, we, Fox 5 News, NBC4. And I started to notice the way that they would present information. I felt like the information that the, the media was presenting was different than reality. When I became a freshman in college, I started, I was kind of an introverted kid. And I just sat in the dining room and I read all the newspapers all day. I loved to read the newspapers. And I would read the New York Times and become indignant mm-hmm. at what I was reading. I thought, well, they're coloring the news. they are It's almost like you have to twist it to see what they're saying. The way they word things, the way that they present information is so different than what the truth is. And that was I, way back then they were doing that because well, they're certainly doing that now. I was 18 in, in uh, 2003. So yeah, yep. I mean, they, Almost this, 20 years this was ago. the George Bush v. John Kerry election. So I decided to do something about it. Mm-hmm. And you might say, what compels a someone to do something? Because this is really the fundamental question. Well, it's a combination of the knowledge that something's wrong and the willingness to just go out and change it. And it's not. it wasn't comfortable for me to go out and try to do something. And I'll tell you what I did in a minute when I was 19 years old. But I felt compelled to do so. Uh, and, and maybe I'm not a psychologist because of how I was raised, my father and what, they, what my mother taught me, what my father taught me, do the right thing. Um, and I knew something was wrong. So at Rutgers, I, the State University of New Jersey, where I was a student, I went out and I went to find out I sort of said, well, I'm going to do something local. I don't want to talk about the Iraq war. I want to talk about something on campus. So I looked into what my professors donated, who they donated to, John Kerry versus George W. Bush. I went to the, it's a public university. You can find this stuff out. You can find out what your professors are making at a public university. So I found out that the ratio of donations to the Democrat versus the Republican was 104 to 1. 104 to 1. Which I thought, well, well, gee, that's <laughs> that's less diversity than under the reign of Genghis Khan. And then I had these professors who were telling me how great communism was, and 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 I wasn't really very political, but I felt like there was this imbalance. I felt like there was this injustice, that there was not a sense of balance. So I decided to start a newspaper called The Centurion, a magazine. I never started a newspaper before. I didn't really know what I was doing. I got a copy of Adobe, uh, then Adobe PageMaker, mm-hmm. then Adobe InDesign. And I went about the business of laying out a magazine, complete with columns. And and uh, and I started doing these walk-in video reports. The first video report I ever did was I went around the history department and I went through all the doors and all these professors were, were decorating their doors, their offices with propaganda. So I 
did sort of a satirical photo shoot and I and I gave an award for the most decorated door. <laughs> and I and there's this professor whose name I forgot, but a history professor just covered in propaganda and campaigns, you know, literature for that then democratic candidate John Kerry. And I said, does it ever do you ever does it ever make your students feel comfortable uncomfortable when they mm. try to talk to you about issues of the day and they're inundated with this partisan stuff? And I had a certificate made called the Centurion Award. Mm -hmm. It was very Michael Moore. It was similar to what Michael Moore used to do back way back in the 80s and early 90s. And I presented him the certificate for most decorated door. Mm -hmm. And did the, you record this? I recorded it with, this is in 2004. This is before YouTube now. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a Kodak, there wasn't even iPhones in 2000. Mm -hmm. It was a Kodak camera with a video digital film option. It was very low frame rate. And I said, here you go, professor. And the guy, to his credit, not everyone took it well. He goes, James, this is the proudest achievement of my academic career. <laughs> this is the first video. And my heart was pounding. I mean, my heart was, it was not a comfortable mm. thing for me to do. I didn't relish in confrontation. Mm -hmm. But again, I felt compelled to do it by the artistry of it, my passion for exposing it. Um, and I felt it was the right thing to do. And from then, we did many other such exposés and 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 the, the most famous one, which to this day is everyone's favorite, or most people's favorite, is on St. Patrick's Day, 2005. Mm, the Lucky Charms. I went into my dining hall with an Irish cap and I said that I was an, uh, I am an Irishman, but I, I, I said that I was a <laughs> member of the Irish Heritage Society. <laughs> And that the box of Lucky Charms offends my Irish heritage. <laughs> and I brought in these colleagues who feigned an Irish accent. Greg Walker took out the Rutgers University speech against defamation harassment. And in that, what's called a speech code, uh, the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education had given us a copy of the speech code. And it said, you're not allowed to offend anybody mm -hmm. for any reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've put them in a lose-lose situation. <laughs> Either... The, the dean of Rutgers, I met with, they have many deans. I met, oh, I guess, the dean of dining services. Um, uh, her name was actually uh, Ms. Knight Cole. And we sat there and I tried to keep a straight face. It was hard. And they had to choose either ban Lucky Charms or violate your own campus speech code. And when I, when I did that, I realized that I was on to something. That that they're to hoist them by their own petard. Like there are rules that they have to live by, not our rules, mm -hmm. not rules of decency and honesty and morality and logic, but rules of perhaps uh, race and sex and class, and perhaps to expose them or to shame them, to reveal the truth about these institutions in society in a postmodern world, mm -hmm. which is the world that I was entering. I didn't know at the time, but as a philosophy major, I was living in a postmodern world where reason and logic didn't apply. Yeah. So that Lucky Charms video, that then it was all off to the races. I, I And I, we could tell the stories, but um, that was in 2005, 2006. And then I went from there, I, I did a, a series of investigations into Planned Parenthood, which we can talk about. Yeah, and we'll then go into one. those. <clears throat> so the Lucky Charms one was really lighthearted. You really didn't care that, uh, that they were... Um, they were taking advantage of uh, Irish heritage. No, right. I was being, matter. I was yeah, being yeah. facetious. Yeah, I was of being. Uh, but now that's happening, and there's no more Aunt Jemima on Aunt Jemima or pancake mix. Irony, and, irony is right, dead. Right, uh, irony right. is, you can't is have dead it anymore. And there's no Indian on Land of Legs butter anymore. But in the New York Times <clears throat> would would later, or, or New York Times got a lot worse, but at the time they characterized what I did as to caricature people by taking it to outlandish extremes. So this is a, this is an important point. You know, investigative journalism. Um, it's been called back in the day. You mentioned muckrakers from a hundred years ago. Well, decades ago, when journalism actually was a thing, they called themselves the custodians of the public's conscience. That's a fancy custodians of conscience. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. It means you. You patrol the boundaries of, of what is an outrage to people mm -hmm. and you test and affirm where that boundary is. Good. Most Good. people, even today, let's call it 98% of people, thinks that it's patently absurd to say that Lucky Charms are racist. Yes, there still is 2% of people 
but most logical people. We'll so it's you're, a joke. You're, Who cares? Right. But yet, that the manufacturer of Aunt Jemima, I think she's not there anymore. Well, this is true. Right. So and, those and, two and, and you could say that that have an out uh, and disproportionate impact on what happens, and that's what's happening in our society. Well, you could say that that boundary yeah. is 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 expanding. Mm-hmm. That people are uh, certainly has, but there still is a lot of consensus to be had. There still is a lot, and I don't want to jump around, but you know, that was the first thing I did. One of the more recent things I did was a communist teacher in California. No, we'll get you know, we, we'll, we'll get there later. Yeah, <clears throat> but but there's it's about consensus, and you know, we go after organizations, you know, exposing illegality in an organization like Planned Parenthood, which I, it, I'm not here to tell you pro-life or pro-choice. It doesn't matter. My point was, you know, and this is something that actually Saul Linsky wrote about, which is that you make them live up to their own book of rules. And with, with Saul Linsky and Planned Parenthood, uh, far, founded by Margaret Sanger, um, I called Planned Parenthood, this is right after Lucky Charms, posing as a donor. Not just any donor, a donor with racist motives. Well, that was Margaret Sanger's motive. That's of right. Starting Planned Parenthood. Most people don't know that. No one but knows she that. She was concerned with blacks in America that they were populating at a greater rate than whites, and she wanted to institute uh, the ability to control the reproductive capabilities of blacks. And they don't. The Planned Parenthood. That that was the founder of Planned Parenthood. That was the founder of Planned Parenthood, and they and, they, and they're, they're mostly located in, in urban places so to shine a light on this go ahead i called planned parenthood posing as a as a as a as a donor i said things that margaret sanger would say and i can't even say it on the air because it's it's a racial thing what she said i don't want to <laughs> quote what well, she but said basically she, she said that we have to control the population she of said quote people. we want to exterminate the n-word population she said that yeah actually. the 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 n-e-g-r-o not just control not control yeah. the growth but exterminate, exterminate right yeah. so so uh, you know again I, it doesn't matter whether you're pro-life or pro-choice the, the point is to expose this fact so I did this, and the vice president of Planned Parenthood named Autumn Kersey. No, wait a minute. You didn't explain what you did do. I, what's that? You didn't explain that you were offering to fund, fund uh, programs abort- at Planned Parenthood yeah. uh, to control black populations. That's what I said. I actually said on the, on the recording, it's so absurd. It's like Borat meets 60 Minutes. I said, um, I want to make a donation to underwrite abortions for minority mm-hmm. in order, because my I, I said I had a son who wanted to go to college, and I didn't want him to compete against affirmative action. It was so racist what I was saying. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was acting of course, to get the reaction, and this vice president hearing all these things says, this is so exciting and understandable. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and she's, she's just ingratiating herself to Because she wants the money. She wants that money, yeah. and, and, and I say I love Margaret Sanger. So this recording comes out, and it, and it causes a firestorm. There are protests from black people protesting outside of Planned Parenthood in like Washington, D.C. Perfect. Um, <laughs> so we're going after these sacred cows, these right. these issues that you're not supposed to. I, I went to this conference as a young 22-year-old kid in New York City, and he was like, why are you investigating Planned Parenthood? They help people. And I thought to myself, well, that may be true, but... I responded by saying all organizations that receive taxpayer dollars deserve to be investigated for doing things wrong. To make wrong. sure they're doing the right thing. Right. And then I met this young woman named Lila Rose, who was a freshman at UCLA. I sort of traveled around the country doing this. And we went in, and, and she said she was uh, underage and was, was raped, a statutory rape from a, an older man. And and they told her to lie, and they told her to... to, to um, they told her to lie about her age, which is which is illegal. We released that video, and Planned Parenthood sent me a cease and desist letter and said, you better take these videos off YouTube. And that was my first test as a 23-year-old kid with, I mean, no money. I had nothing. And I had this billion-dollar company threatening me with criminal and civil penalties if I don't take the video down, the cease and desist letter. I Rather than take the video down, I sent the, the letter to the O'Reilly Factor, and they had... <laughs> Lila on this diminutive 18 year old girl, and then Planned Parenthood backed down. And I learned that was my first real big lesson in life, which was you always got to do the right thing, and you can't comp, you can't settle, and you can't give them any, you can't negotiate with terrorists, so to speak. 
You can't settle litigation. You can't you see, back that down. That would have been uh, contrary to any recommendation you would get from an, an attorney at that time. If you went to an attorney with that letter of cease and desist, they would have told you, gee, you should probably, let's meet with them. We'll see if we can do this or that. And they would, uh, an attorney would probably tell you to take it down. Yes. And yeah. that is not the way to win. The way to win yeah. is to find a way around what they're demanding. And you went to O'Reilly and it made it made national news and they backed up. It was this it's a very important moment I got that letter. And uh, you know, it's kind of an anecdote no one knows about. But I've I've been through this now hundred and fifty times, similar anecdotes, and every time you're you're test you're tested. Mm -hmm. You're being tested. And it's it's fear. And you can't make decisions based upon fear. And this was, uh, they were going to get me on statute 632 of the California Penal Code recording in California, although we're in a public place. But when you're holding this letter and you've got this- And you're a kid. You're a kid and you don't know anything, yeah. but there's this little part of me, this little, this this part of me, I remember, I remember holding this letter thinking, people should see this letter. Mm. And, and that was the kind of- um, hopeful, naive part of me that to this day still exists. People need to see this letter. Right. It's, that they're you know, stopping me from showing the facts. And, and later on in this podcast, I'm just foreshadowing, I won't get into it yet. I had that same moment three weeks ago mm -hmm. uh, where, of, at the time of this filming when, when I got that grand jury subpoena and they said, don't talk about it. When the New York Times knew about it, and I said, people now, You need... can't talk about it. Yeah. It's your business, but the New York Times... Well, we'll get into we'll that. We'll get into that later. Now, but, tell me yeah. about another situation. And this was his first major case. It was about 2009 when he and his, a female associate dressed as a pimp and a prostitute and went into an office of ACORN, which is a, was a left-leaning community organization. They went there to apply for a loan. This is hilarious. Tell the story. <laughs> Well, it's quite a story. Um, bottom line up front, um, I went in as a pimp and I had this young woman who was a pretending to be a prostitute and we went from office to office and they were telling me how to disguise our business and call it something else. And this was ACORN, which is the Association of Community Organizations for Reform Now. Um, was was oh, Barack Obama was a lawyer for Acorn. He was an attorney in Chicago for Acorn, and they did a lot of ho housing loans. But and, just back up, you yeah. went in there, said where, uh, and Acorn was helping people in in communities, Baltimore, to, New York, and, Philadelphia, and, 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 cent, and central we city go communities. In there. To to and they were helped by the government. The government it, gave them yeah. money to help people in the community apply for loans, ha apply for housing loans. Yeah. They did some voter registration, and they were they were they had been convicted of. People at Acorn were doing voter fraud. You can read John Fund's book about that. There were, there were examples of fraud. It was founded by this this white guy in Arkansas, Wade Rathke was his name. So, I didn't really know what Acorn was, but this young woman, Hannah Giles, twenty years old, sends me a Facebook message. I love what you did with Planned Parenthood. She says, "What about going into this group, Acorn?" And and I said, "Well, what's your idea?" because this is what people do. They send me these ideas. They send me these whistleblowers. Great. And she goes, well, what if you went in there and said you were a hooker and said that you had a ladies of the night in your house and you wanted a loan? And I immediately thought, well, that's genius because you're going to test whether these people are breaking the law, whether they're willing to break the law. It's kind of like a sting operation. Sure. So I said, would you be willing to be the hooker? Would you be willing? I mean, this 20-year-old girl I'd never met before in my life. Yeah. But she was very attractive, and, and she seemed like she had some <laughs> spunk, and she seemed like she was from Miami, and I saw the pictures. Yeah, and looked pretty good. She, she's dr <laughs> dressed the way she was. Maybe she'd do it. She said, absolutely, I'll do it. It's my idea. I'd love to do it. <laughs> I said, okay. And then I said, well, we're going to need a pimp, you know, because there has to be as a hooker, there yeah. has to be a pimp. So I, I went, I was trying to cast the role mm. of this undercover journalist as a pimp. I found this guy. Uh, a guy in New Jersey, he was going to do it and he backed out at the last minute. So I became the pimp and I needed a costume, a wardrobe. So I asked my... Not too hard. I, <laughs> Leather coat. <laughs> I, I, I asked my Chains. grandmother at the yeah, time yeah. if she had a fur shawl or like a fur coat and she had this <laughs> chinchilla thing in the closet. So the chinchilla coat, 
I got a pimp cane, a hat, yeah. and Hannah, and we go from off. I mean, we had. I want to emphasize something to you. We had no money, negative equity. I mean, I was broke. I was. I was living PV at home. Didn't exist yet. Project Veritas didn't exist. Not for another year. Right. And I was just trying to make this. I had this thing called Veritas, but it wasn't even Project Veritas yet. It was just a YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. So I had no money. I was so broke. I took the the Chesapeake Bay Bridge instead of the. Baltimore tunnel down to DC because one didn't have a toll. <laughs> uh, Four dollars versus one dollar. And, but and, and and what kind of equipment did you have? I had a I had a um a uh, my mother had purchased me a um uh a camcorder from Best Buy, mm-hmm. which was probably a hundred and eighty bucks, and I did save a bunch of money up to buy a hidden camera. And it was this little black box. Um, they've come a long way in the last 12 years, but th- it had an SD chip into it and it was a, a tie. So the wire went into a tie, it was a satin tie, and it was going. the wire went into a box. I go into this Baltimore Acorn office, and, and this is an extraordinary bit, it's still on YouTube. It's got, it's got a million views. And I said, <laughs> we're gonna start this prostitution business. And to my shock, the woman, uh, Shira Williams was her name. Across the table says, "Hey Tanya, we're gonna have to get some taxes and help these guys out with their tax." <laughs> this is great. <laughs> and the whole time I'm thinking, I hope this camera is still functional. Yeah. And she comes back and she's now performing artists. You could be that. And I said, "But I'm, but we're we're a prostitution business." And she said, "I know, but you can't say that on the tax forms." <laughs> and she says, "And she says dancing. You could be a dancer." Yeah. And I said, "Well, sex is kind of like dancing." And she said, yeah, "Exactly." So we have this. I mean, ridiculous. Helpful. helpful. I mean, she was very, very helpful. helpful. And then I said I had thirteen underage prostitutes. This is I'm I'm saying these. I'm just thinking of the most outrageous things I could say. And she and the woman actually said to me, "You can declare them as dependents on your tax forms." And the whole time I'm thinking, I hope I'm getting this. I hope the shot is she's in my camera. So this happens and we leave the facility. And the moment we leave the facility, I mean, my heart's beating at 150 beats per minute. I'm just, I mean, it just like in the, in the movies, I'm trying to keep a straight face. I could get found out. I'm in a, I'm a, in a very dangerous section of Baltimore. And by the way, you don't see pimps and hookers the way we looked there. Mm-hmm. We get in the car, I look at the footage, I got it. And I knew that it was historic. And then Hannah and I decided to go to other locations on the East Coast, D.C., New York. Same Brooklyn. organization. Uh, mm-hmm. we, Same also, we, went, we went to San Diego. We went to the Acorn in San Diego. We won a national city, California. Mm-hmm. Yep. And every time we went, except one, they helped us. They gave us tax advice. In Brooklyn, they said to hide the pimp cash in the ground away from the authorities. In uh, Washington, D.C., they told us to not tell the police. So we showed the sort of people that these people are, not, no moral compass, willing to break the law. Dr. Bob, the, uh, we broke the story on, uh, on September 9th, 2009. Every day we released another video. I remember. And every remember. video that we released, the media said, that's just an isolated incident. <laughs> and, and then on the fourth or fifth day, the House of Representatives, then democratically controlled, voted to defund acorn and then a day or two later the senate 83 to 7 that's unheard of in a democratically controlled united states senate voted to defund acorn and president barack obama signed that legislation uh september i believe 17th 2009 so in one week two kids from the cast of high school musical three with no money and their grandmother's chinchilla coat defunded acorn in the united states congress um and I went from no, nothing to suddenly um, on the Daily Show with John Stewart. Andrew Breitbart hired me, you know, gave me a you know you know five thousand dollars a month as a as a as which was to me at that point great, great. astronomical amounts of money uh, to live, and um, that 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 was the beginning of a lot. But the people, you know, everyone watches the news these days, and they say, well. Things are turning to shit. Things look terrible, but what can we do? There is something you can do. Every one of you can do something. What he did wasn't extraordinary. It was extraordinary creativity and courage, but it didn't take a lot of money to do it. It took the desire. 
and 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 the chutzpah, the nerve, to go out and do it. And that caused Acorn to be defunded, and I believe it was later went out of business. Or it was totally yes. defunded, went out of business. He put uh, he put a criminal enterprise, or or an enterprise that was clearly breaking the law, out of business. Single-handedly, he and this girl, single-handedly, with maybe two hundred or three hundred dollars worth of equipment, yeah. did the right thing. So, people who say, "What can we do?" There's something everybody can do. So that was your first major success, and after yeah. that, you decided to start Project Veritas. Yes, there was a little bit of a you know detour, and I don't. You can tell me if I'm getting off track in our interview here, but uh, after that, I I decided. Uh, I, I was doing this for three, four years in a minor way, not getting a ton of attention. The Planned Parenthood stuff got some, not a ton of attention. But now everyone was sold. Okay, this is the future. And people didn't want to do this sort of journalism. People were criticizing it, but for some reason, the mainstream media was unwilling to do this. They were unwilling to ask questions. They were unwilling to go into these offices. John Stewart, who's no conservative... John Stewart on The Daily Show uh, did this segment where he he said to the media, where the hell were all you journalists? Why does it take these two kids with no money to do this? So it was such They're an, sitting in their office. It was such an indictment on the whole media machine. So I, I went out and started doing it. I did a lot of, I started doing other stories. I was in New Orleans. Um, yeah, you got in trouble Doing there. a story and I got so in trouble. So why did you... Why were you in New Orleans? There was some congressman. Senator know, Landrew. Um, Landrow. Senator Landrew. Right. This was the Louisiana Purchase, the so-called. And this is this is a state senator or a U.S. United senator? United States senator. U.S. senator. Because the um, Barack Obama, <clears throat> this was the uh, Obamacare. And, and there were a couple moderate Democrats like, like Mary Landrew in New Orleans who they were trying to get to vote for this thing. So we came up with this idea, and we were doing many different things. This was not going to be a very big story, but we thought she had said publicly that her, her phones were jammed. Her phone lines were jammed up, and uh, she said, and constituents were unable to talk to her. So we thought it would be kind of funny, not the best idea, but certainly not a criminal idea, for us to go into her office, which is a public office, dressed up like telephone technicians, <laughs> and, and sort of ask questions like, do you want do you want to ignore your do you want us to do you want us to disconnect your phone so that your constituents don't don't have to talk to you because her constituents were pissed. They wanted her to vote against it. They wanted her to vote against it. Right. And she was like, and she's saying, my phones, my phones are jammed. I'm not going to answer the phone. So we wanted to capture candid commentary mm. like we did with Acorn, where she said, you weren't going to touch her phones. Never, never. Right. And we didn't have any equipment with us to do so. Right. But. It, people, and, and at the time, the, the, meta, the, the analogy I drew was I wasn't going to whore out underage girls with Acorn. The I said thing. I yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, I could say, yes, let me take your shut your phones down, but I would never do it. Right. I said, I have a traffic, I have, I have, a, I have a shipping container with 13 underage whores. I'm not actually going to ship in underage whores. I, I say things to get reactions of out course. of people, You're as, a as reporters do. You are a provocateur. Right. That's and what that's they how say. you get things done. So- I go in there, and this I could. I'm going to tell the story in two minutes, and it's an hour long story. I'll tell it in two minutes. No, no, take your time. I go I in there. Know. We want the viewers want to know the details. I show my. I wrote a whole book about this. It's called Breakthrough, New York Times bestselling book about the what happened in New Orleans. I go in there, and um, so it's a federal office building. You got to show ID. You got to show ID, and there's you know a metal detector, but yeah. it's an open building, and right. the door's open. And I go in there, three of my colleagues, and the plan was for me to have. With with film with a phone, so I, but be to be the eavesdropper, the guy who's sitting on the couch recording the I interaction. See. I see. So I don't even. I'm not even supposed to know my colleagues. Right, and you're not dressed as a phone man. Nope, I'm just dressed in, in khakis and a button down shirt, mm. and they're they put on these goofy reflecting vests and and plastic help you know party <laughs> city helmets. They look <laughs> like the village people, <laughs> and they get into the office and they start to have conversations with the staff. And I'm sitting on the couch recording this and. And suddenly the, the people go, you guys don't look like your, your telephone people. And I, I realize, okay, the gig is up, guys, let's go. But I can't say, guys, let's go, because I'm supposed to be the guy on the couch, right? the third party. 
Now, just so you, that you know no laws are broken, we showed our real driver's license at the entrance of the building. We didn't enter by false pretense. We presented ourselves as who we were. We just wore a goofy a goofy shirt. I didn't know that because yep. what I read, yep. well, the yep. claim was that you entered under false pretenses with false IDs. So eventually I, I pled guilty to a misdemeanor, which was entry by false pretense, but... I should not, That my lesson was I should not have done that. I yeah. should not have pled guilty to something I did not do. But what the feds did, which is the reason why I made the decision at the we'll time, charge you with was charge me with something far more heinous. Right. They, and that's what they do. So they they, they, they arrested us on the spot. Um, the We were in a federal building, so these, this FBI has jurisdiction because it's a federal building. Um, and this is New Orleans, so it's you're you're kind of you know behind enemy lines, as it were, um, and and they arrested us and they 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 held us for a while. They interviewed me. Of course, my first temptation was to talk mm -hmm. because I did nothing wrong, um, and I, I all of our stories matched up. It was pretty extraordinary. They 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 quarantined us and they interviewed us and they put me in handcuffs. This is this is eleven years ago. And I told them I make YouTube videos. I'm just doing a video report. They said, oh, you're the guy who did the acorn story. And I said, yes, thinking this would help me. Mm -hmm. And they looked at each other, just like a scene out of a movie. And these two agents said, boy, I think we're going to have to keep you overnight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, it was like they hadn't figured out who won the Civil War. So then I go to jail and they put me in a shackles and an orange jumpsuit and they... I spend the night, and then they put me in front of a of a of a Slavin public defender, and he tells me I'm being charged with ten years in prison for trying to destroy federal property, mm. for literally walking into an open senator's office mm -hmm. with nothing but a weird looking shirt. And I thought to myself, my life is over. I'm 25 years old. I'm sitting in federal mm. prison, awaiting an arraignment for something I did not do. Mm. To make a long story short, um, eventually the, the felony was dropped, and um, oh, so who represented you? You took a, a public defender at that point. So it's this whole story. Initially, the um, um, I'm sitting in jail, and uh, I mean, I mean, I'm in shackles. I mean, I'm shackled on my feet, my wrists. They got a leather belt. I'm Timothy McVeigh for doing Shh. journalism for a reporter's notebook, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. and. It was terrifying, and I and I, I I went to my arraignment, and same thing. This is a, a, a magistrate judge or a federal judge, and he goes, "You boys, Eagle Scouts, you you went to law school," and I, and I kept saying, "Yes, Your Honor, yes, Your Honor," thinking this would help me. Well, the, you shouldn't have done this horrible federal crime. <laughs> and at that moment, the news of what has happened to me had gotten to the world. This is over the course of about two days. I had yet to be able to. I was not yet a free man. I was going through the the prison system and being arraigned. And then my lawyer ran into the courtroom from from the Acorn days, the, my lawyer, and and represented me. And I made uh, a bail or bond. I had to sign the carbon paper. I was in shackles. So I climbed up on top of the table to sign the papers. They brought me back to the jail. They took my belt, my phone, and my wallet, and I and I made bail. In, at this New Orleans parish prison, I walked out of the jail with no money, no wallet, and there was a sea of photographers. And they were all taking my picture. My pants were falling down. I hadn't showered in days. Um, and and that, that to this day, if you- when, when they release you on bail, they don't give you back your possessions? No. no. The FBI took my phone, my wallet, and my belt. And I walked out, I had to panhandle for cash to, to get back to my lawyer's office um, and uh, in New Orleans. And then I flew back to DC. And I spent four or five months on what's called pretrial release. This is 25 years old. And they dropped the felony. They found no evidence for any felony. The, the feds admitted they didn't find anything. And they refiled the charges to a misdemeanor, which I pled guilty to. Um, and to this day, I, I I wish I did not do that. You were younger. It was a class B misdemeanor. I thought, oh, it's just a, it's just an it's a petty crime. The problem was at my sentencing for this class B misdemeanor, the federal judge gave me three years 
of supervised probation. And at the time I thought, well, that just means don't break the law. No, it, it was worse than that. From age 25 through 28, I was, I was sort of confined and they, they monitored everything I did. Now, all of this- And you couldn't travel, as I recall. I couldn't travel without, without permission. permission from three different people, a probation officer, a United States attorney, and a federal judge. Just to go anywhere. Of course, that's very cost prohibitive, not to mention cumbersome. Mm -hmm. For a journalist who has For to travel. For a journalist. Right. And, and, and the media treated it like it was Watergate. I had wiretapped. All this was bullshit. I got a lot of retractions over it. And this was painful. I mean, it was really- I remember. I was, remember was, dealing with you, James, when yeah. you were on probation. You yep. couldn't come visit. I remember that. It was painful. But things happen for a reason. And that forced me to build a company and to send cameras out to other people and to do the things that... I did a story in New Hampshire. I think this is around the time I met you where mm -hmm. my colleagues went to New Hampshire. I didn't go. I was stuck in that carriage This house. is around 2012. Yes. When there was... Uh, this was a primary for the presidency or something, yep, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, good memory. All right, tell us that story. New Hampshire, 2012. A couple of my colleagues had... Went up to New Hampshire. We got the list of all the names of the yeah, dead. The concern was faulty voting or illegal voting or uncontrolled passing out of ballots. That that was the, the issue. There was we got the list of all the registered voters and all the people who are deceased and found overlaps. Mm -hmm. And, we and went, they didn't do that. This this is something that you would think the people who run or who are involved in government, who are involved in controlling the voting process would every year, every six months, compare the voter list with with the death certificates right. or the with roles the obituaries. Were, the roles were all messed up and and, and there was <clears> So some nobody's dis doing it. Discussion of cleaning up the role. Tom Fitton has done a lot of work on this. So mm -hmm. at the time I thought it'd be clever. But why did you pick give us some background. Why did you pick New Hampshire? Why because one of my <clears> closest <throat> two of my colleagues lived there. Uh, at the time, I had a very small, very small unit of, of guys. And, and Joe Barton and Spencer Meads were both from New Hampshire. And it was a presidential primary state. So we came up with this idea. And they went around to the polls on election day and, and did not say they were the dead person. They said, um, do you have John Smith on your rolls? And the woman proceeded to present them the ballot showing how easy it was to commit voter fraud. They didn't fraud. even have to ask. They did, and they refused, and they insisted, no, no, here's your ballot. So this this comes out, and it causes a firestorm in New Hampshire. I mean, the, the, the people said voter fraud was impossible. We had, we had proved that it was possible to commit impersonation voter fraud, even though they say it's rare. They were saying it was impossible. We had changed their minds. Mm -hmm. New Hampshire passed a law because of what we had exposed, a voter ID law, which overrode the governor's veto of that legislation. Governor, then Democratic Governor Lynch of New Hampshire, called for my, again, prosecution, sensing a pattern here. They always want to incarcerate me for, for reporting on information. My whole life, they've wanted to incarcerate me for exposing things. Mm -hmm. He said, we shouldn't have these out-of-staters coming to New Hampshire. Well, first of all- I read that quote. <laughs> to, to violate our laws, yep. and that's not what you were. Well, that's doing. not what we didn't. We didn't break the law. We asked questions. Right. We asked questions. Do you have somebody, and they handed you the ballot. So, so this comes out, and you have to again. You have to understand how extraordinary and surreal the circumstances are. Young James is sitting in like the carriage house of the. Of, this was the house that my dad and I restored when we were. I was a little kid. I couldn't leave without permission from a federal judge, a U.S. attorney, and a probation officer. The probation officer would come to my parents' house and you know my house. I lived in the attic of this garage, and would give me random drug tests and harass me and 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 look through every dollar I spent because they've got nothing better to do for three years. And when I broke the story in New Hampshire, the probation officer came to my house and they said to my father, where's your son? And my father would say, he's in the garage. And they said, well, well he's doing stories in New Hampshire. And he said, my son hasn't left that garage in days. So you have to understand how extraordinary this was. I, I did these stories while, while basically confined. And eventually they would let me travel a little bit, but I had to... I, they, they wanted to destroy me. They wanted to stop me and break my will. And I, via proxy, via other people, 
I was able to keep this going and Project Veritas was born. And the other major story we did around the time, there's one other huge story that really put us on the map, was the NPR story. And that was that was so big that it forced the CEO of NPR, Vivian Schiller, to resign. Uh, this was a story we had two guys dress up as Muslim fundamentalists oh, with, I don't know this with the Muslim Brotherhood. And they met with CEO's vice president and NPR CEO, Vivian Schiller, and they said they wanted to make a $5 million donation for the Muslim Brotherhood. They met them at a Tony Georgetown eatery, Cafe Milano in Washington, D.C., and then the NPR executives said all types of horrible things and anti-Semitic things and said, and, and again, I'm quoting them here, so forgive what I'm saying, I'm quoting them. Uh, the NPR vice president said that the Jews control the newspapers, but not NPR, is what he said. And um, it was such a horrible thing that the, even the Anti-Defamation League came out and, and, and condemned it. And he also said that, um, that, the, that the Tea Party is racist and all these things that you'd expect these sort of champagne swirling NPR executives to say, it was all captured on a hidden camera while I was sitting in that garage. So this came out and it was, it was big. And at this point people realized, I guess James O'Keefe isn't going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> right. And they did change the law in, uh, in New Hampshire on voting, right? They changed the law in New Hampshire. And we did the same thing in Washington, D.C. with Eric Holder's ballot. We went to his pol uh, polling booth. And again, the, uh, Eric Holder was then a 61-year-old African-American attorney general. I black, sent a 20 right, black, black. Right. I sent a 23-year-old white guy. And uh, he simply said, hey, do you have Eric Holder? And the guy handed him Eric Holder's ballot. <laughs> and this caused an investigation. And you have to understand, too, that, like, you know, it's like Animal Farm. They don't want voter ID. Voter ID is racist. But after we did that, the polling officials in the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., put a picture of Eric Holder on his polling booth. <laughs> Voter ID for me, not for thee. I see. And I and, see. and we were exposing. See, just his picture, not everybody's picture. No, no, picture. no. We, they actually had a picture of him just for him. Yeah. But we don't believe in voter ID. Mm. So mm. You're, you're really exposing who these people are. And it's a beautiful thing, isn't it, to expose the hypocrisy and the absurdity of life. It takes courage. And, takes that's, courage. and that was the and beginning. You, and you yeah. did this. While you're on probation, I did all of this in on probation. Your, in the attic of your parents. House. It was literally mm -hmm. that first house I described to you as a very, I mean, five, six, seven, right. eight year old boy. That you helped. Rebuild. I helped. This this garage was um, literally about to be condemned, and my father and grandfather saved it. It was an 1890 carriage house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is before automobiles. So it's a it looks like a garage, but they put the carriage Carriages downstairs, up. and you got the attic. And that's where you were. When it was these a two hundred and fifty square foot space. And where did you get the uh, the two associates who went in as uh, as uh, these Spencer, Arabs? Well, uh, those two guys were named Ken Larry and Sean Adelaide. I met Sean in New Orleans. Um, were and, they of uh, 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 yeah. Arabic descent? Or Sean Adelaide was Nigerian, so mm -hmm. he kind of played the part of a of an Arabic African man. Right. And the other guy, Ken Larry, uh, went tanning and got a beard, and <laughs> and, uh, and and they had a, a hidden camera in a bag. And it was just. And they dressed in Arab gear, or what? What did they? How did they dress? They, they, they had a website yep. called Muslim. Education Action Center. I see. And they just for this they set up the just website. for this. Yeah. They set up a website and they and they it was a phony website. Um, you know, it was so absurd. And and they said they wanted to make a, a donation and they got a limousine. They picked up Ron Schiller and Vivian Schiller, no of no relation to each other. They both work for NPR. In a, in a stretch limo and brought them to this restaurant. Mm -hmm. And they were willing to take the donation. They were willing to take the five mil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were, and, and they said all these things. Um, Perfect. And and this was this was the the things I've described to you thus far was kind of the beginnings of Project Veritas. This is from two thousand nine to two thousand and twelve, th and this was the, the 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 genesis, the heart and soul. And it was not easy. In fact, in New Hampshire, speaking of prosecution, um, the the Attorney General of New Hampshire, whose name and I cannot make this up. The guy's name was actually Richard Head, Dick <laughs> Head. 
<laughs> Guy's name is Dickhead. Um, Dickhead uh, issued <clears throat> issued the subpoena and 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 harassed Spencer, my colleague, um, for doing what he did in New Hampshire. They sent agents to his house. They harassed him, just like what we're going through recently. And and I can tell you, it it it, it was terrifying. The reason it was terrifying is because. In all these moments in life, whether it's in federal prison, you know, for, or the a dickhead in New Hampshire, and we'll get to this later, the FBI raid, you're you you feel this this cloud of of dread because they have so much power, and to be doing this, you often feel alone. Mm -hmm. And I know people like you are behind me, and I know that there's a lot of people like you, big and small, whether they donate or not. They're, but you feel like you're alone mm -hmm. because you're the only one doing it. You're there. It's, because, because you're on the front you're lines. You're the one who's going to go to jail. You're the one there clamping the handcuffs It's on. like the guy that on the uh, the battlefield that is holding the flag and they're the first one. Mm -hmm. You're the first one that's going to get shot down. So you just feel alone. I remember I remember sitting in that carriage house and there's a letter from Dick Head. I'm, I'm not making this up. The guy's name was Richard Head. And he's... And you're, are they going to arrest me? Are, am I going back to jail in Louisiana? You don't have a safety net. And and the people on the right, uh, conservative movement, don't understand. They don't, they don't, they go, oh, O'Keefe's in trouble. He must have done something wrong. No, mm, not at all. we didn't break the law, but not they don't like controversy because, and I hate to put it in left, right terms, but it's become this way. The, the media is so monolithic in one direction that people on the right are terrified of the media branding them a certain way. Right. So they're afraid to be disliked by the people who buy ink by the barrel. So when I'm in those moments, I'm on my own. I, I am literally, we're, we were leading something and people were sitting on the sidelines. Is he going to make it out of this alive? Is he going to be okay? And I didn't know if I was going to be okay. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. Incredible bravery. Incredible. And you continue to do it. Does it get easier now, now that you know that it's bullshit and you're going to have your attorney help you? Does, does it get easier or you're still worried Well, easy time? is not the, di easy hard is not the dichotomy I would describe. The, 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 the dynamic. You're less worried. The dynamic I would characterize it is, is now we have such a huge following yep. that that has its own power. That we have two, you know, 1.5 million Instagram followers, right. and have, more importantly, you have congressmen and senators who know you. The president knows you. Yes, the, uh, the former president. Yeah, and 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 the the megaphone that we have, the 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 only thing these people fear, and I and I'm speaking about the people who do ill to us, the people mm -hmm. who are who are the enemy. engaging in corrupt acts, whoever they may be, the powers that be that want to incarcerate me for nothing. The thing that they fear more than anything else is being exposed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They don't want people to know what's happening behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. So in Louisiana, and this is very important, I tell the story, three years after that whole ordeal, when I got off federal, I became a free man May 26, 2013. Shortly thereafter, it came out that all the people who prosecuted me, uh, Sal Perricone, Jim Letton, all these U.S. attorneys in the Southern District of Louis, Eastern District of Louisiana, they all resigned in disgrace because what they were doing, particularly Sal Perricone, the prosecutor, is he was going online on the comments section of the New Orleans Times-Picayune, which is the newspaper, and he was anonymously blogging about me during the case. So these, this is against the law. Prosecutors mm. cannot do this. And there's a huge scandal. It's called the Dazinger Bridge scandal in Louisiana. And all these people who did wrong acts, who who who, who engaged unethically, were, were resigned in disgrace, and and they were disbarred. Disbarred. Really? Now, yes. Who who uncovered that? Somebody well, else. It was a different law. It was a different uh, a case called the Dazinger Bridge case, where they brought prosecutions against police officers. And in that case. They were doing this. They were blogging anonymously, writing online. You can't, if you're a federal prosecutor, you can't do that. It's 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 against the and, law. And that that's an attempt to uh, uh, to sway witnesses. Correct. Or, right. Or, it's or, a, or a or violation jurors. of federal ethics laws. I see. And 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 it shows the venality. It shows mm. it shows the the mentality of these people. And in that case, 
it, can't, it they weren't only blogging anonymously about those people. It, it, you could see they were doing it about O'Keefe. It was in the exhibits. And what I had suspected to be the case turned out to be true. So the moral of the story is all the prosecutors in New Orleans, the, the lead United States attorney, Jim Letton, resigned in disgrace. And I confronted him on the street after I became a free man with my book. I wrote a book about it. And I said, Jim, here's your book. You know, Mr. Letton, here's your, the book I wrote about this. And he threw the book in my face and called me a spud, which is funny enough, <laughs> an Irish racial slur. Mm. And he goes, you're a nasty spud. He was screaming and hollering. He called the local cops. I'm on the sidewalk with a microphone. Um, and that guy, by the way, mm. after he resigned in disgrace, he teach. He was a dean at Tulane Law School. And he, he was then. He got appointed. He was then. I don't know what he's doing now, yeah. but this is 2013. And you couldn't get your case thrown out even though he, it was over. I tried. My lawyer said if it was anywhere else but Louisiana, mm -hmm. if it was anywhere else but Louisiana, mm -hmm. th this was this was a, a tough... A t but, but I guess my, the point of m this particular story for your audience is I, I do believe that good will defeat evil in the end. And I think that sometimes that arc bends a little slow um, and maybe it bends real slow. But in that case in New Orleans, uh, all the people who, who behaved unethically and behaved like scum, well, eventually they, those, some of those folks were disbarred. They lost their law license for what they did. Fantastic. But still teaching. Yeah. Still has a career. This is true. Wow. That's Louisiana for you. That's right. All right then there's um, a lighter story I wanted you to go into. I remember reading about uh, where, of course... The border is very interesting these days with the open border, Trump's wall, not a wall, and he's to fall, he's to blame. And now we have thousands, <clears throat> tens of thousands of illegal aliens uh, coming into the border. You know, and, and people say you can't call them that. They're undocumented uh, alien, undocumented people. That's like saying a bank robber is taking undocumented withdrawals. Right. You know, so at any rate, so it, it's in the news now. And... So it's very a, a very timely to talk about it because it was, I think it was around 2014 where you were concerned about the border. I forget maybe it was important then. Too. It's always been important, but you you keyed onto it, and people were saying, "Oh, the border's safe. The border's safe." And you did something that was just incredibly ingenious and funny, and showed how the border was so pervy, permeable. Yeah, this went back to my teenage years, and I, I remember thinking, well, I don't get it. Like, people are just crossing that border. And, and, and Harry Reid said our border was secure. I remember that. I mean, that's, that's an absurd statement. Whether you think it should or shouldn't be, don't say that it is. Mm -hmm. So we came up with this idea. I don't remember how. I, I think it was a combination of ideas. It was a synergy of ideas. Someone said you ought to go down there and expose ISIS crossing the border. And I said, well, maybe if I... Maybe if I, what's the world's most notorious terrorist? Mm -hmm. Well, now deceased, but not then. O Osama bin Laden. Not then. He was alive and well. So we we go down to the border, and I and I dress up like the, make, make it well, clear. actually where, the border where? Well, well just to, just to be close, this is 2014. So he was deceased for three years because Osama bin Laden was shot in 2011 by the Navy SEALs. But this was in West Texas. Uh, what's the Hutspeth County? 60 miles southeast of the Rio, Rio Grande, Texas, mm -hmm. uh, El Paso, Texas. So we're in the middle of nowhere. On the, on the Mexican side or the Texas side? I mean, on the Texas side, but the, but the Rio Grande River in Hutspeth County is literally the width of this room. I mean, mm -hmm. it, is a, it looks like a drainage ditch. Mm -hmm. It is not really a river. So we go down there, accompanied by Sheriff Arvin West, of the sheriff of that county of Texas. And I'm dressed like... Osama bin Laden. I've got the army fatigues. I've got I the mask, the pictures, yep. tennis shoes. We'll be showing those pictures. And I, I, I begin to cross the river. And um, I go to the Mexican uh, Mexico side and I cross back and forth and, and take some video and <laughs> there's no border patrol. And and I go, I, I, I go sort of clamoring through the desert, interstate, is it interstate 10? I can't remember. The, it's got to be a couple miles away. And I'm just running through the desert like a cartoon character. <laughs> and I do see like white trucks in the distance, but they're just driving away. Mm -hmm. um, so this video comes out and this was a hoot. I mean, this if you haven't seen it, it's funny as hell. 
and it causes a congressional hearing between uh, John McCain and then the uh, Undersecretary for Department of Homeland Security. And John McCain says, John McCain, Senator John, late Senator John McCain says to the Undersecretary of Homeland Security, have you seen this report from James O'Keefe crossing the Rio Grande River undetected? And the guy goes, he was not undetected. We saw him cross. And McCain goes, so why didn't you stop him? And the guy goes, sir, I can't answer that question. <laughs> so this is an extraordinary moment mm -hmm. uh, in Congress. Now this happens, and of course I've embarrassed another government there you agency. Go. There you go. So what do they do to me? This is now 2015, and I, I've, I've traveled internationally a couple times, um, once to Greece, once to Canada, and when I come back in the country, I'm detained by the Customs and Border Patrol numerous times and they harass me and they ask me what I'm doing and they and they go through my luggage. Some of them curse at me. And I, I keep getting detained every time I cross in the United States. And I'm like, what is going on? Am I on some list? Mm -hmm. Why am I being detained? Mm -hmm. And one day, months later, I'm in Seattle, Washington, coming across from, uh, from Canada and at this point, I become very curious. I look over to look at the computer screen of the agent, and and this time, the computer was not covered with a with a privacy screen, so I could see what it said. And it said this, and I know it word for word. It said, "Quote: Subject is an amateur reporter, and who engages in publicity stunts, including." dressing up as Osama bin Laden and crossing the Rio Grande River, quote unquote. That's what it said. Now, by the way, that's unconstitutional. I'm an American citizen. I'm a journalist. Mm -hmm. Whether you call it publicity stunts mm -hmm. or I embarrass people or whatever they want to word it, they would never do that to an NBC News reporter. They would never do that to the guy on, uh, is it Univision, who, who, who swam in the river to, to show what life was like. They would never do that to those people. I had a, I have an American passport, by the way. Mm -hmm. But why would that cause them to stop you and harass you? There must have been more to it. That's I a bet. great question, yeah. but it's wrong. Now, it wasn't until I made a video about my being detained, mm -hmm. including the language I just quoted to you, and Tom Fitton filed a, a series FOI? of FOIA? FOIA requests, and we got all redacted, by the way. The mm -hmm. reason for my detention was redacted but I recorded my interactions with these Customs and Border Patrol agents, including them asking me who I'm voting for, what my next projects are. Ooh. The moment I released that, this was, there was, this is, um, there was an <clears throat> honest reporter at the Washington Post who was a good reporter. This is six years ago. World's changed in six years, by the way. And I think his name was Jerry Markin, and he's now retired. And he wrote a story about my being detained at the border. And right after that happened, I was never detained again. The reason I tell you that story is because the only thing these people fear is the being, is exposed. being exposed. So you have to record everything wherever you are. Where as long as it's legal. As long as as right. long as and it's it legal. It differs in each state. Is it, that correct? It, it differs in thirty eight states, it's legal in twelve states. Mm -hmm. There are there are it's trickier. So, so this happened with, with the Border Patrol, and um, it really taught me. It's like, wow, they fear the Washington Post more than they fear. They fear publicity. They, what they fear is sunlight. If you're doing something wrong, mm -hmm. like detaining American mm -hmm. citizens and hiding the reasons why, what they fear is my little camera recording their computer screen. That's the only thing they fear. That's what they fear. They fear people knowing what they're doing. They have to have that veneer. They have to lie to the people about what they're doing. And, 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 I, and I know it's a, tri it's, it's a tale as old as time, it's a cliche, but I don't, think the Ameri I don't think the American people, I don't think they realize just how much they're being lied to by the powers that be and how that, the powers that be, they're meek. They're not strong men, they're meek. They rely upon these oversimplifications and these deceits. No, they rely on the power of their agency. Right. Right? They, they are cowards, but they're bullies. And they're bullies because they have power of an agency. Correct. That, right? that's, 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 mm -hmm. that's another way of saying it. Mm -hmm. so, so that was mm. another war story. Um, and for everything you're finding, 
if we had 10 Project Veritas's, there would be 10 times as many stories. Yes. There would be. That, that's the vision. Right. right. The you, vision. I'm sure if I asked you, <clears throat> let me ask you, if you had a bigger staff, you could do more investigations. There are plenty of things to be investigated that you that you have a good sense uh, of cover up where they're doing something illegal or unethical that you can't just follow up on them because you don't have enough staff. Right. We're always trying to find, and, and, and we're very diligent about who we hire because this is not for everyone. It's not for the faint of heart. Mm -hmm. And not everyone can do it. But I think the um, I think the answer is we do need to expand carefully and slowly. We have we have over sixty employees now. But what's changed, as I said to you, um, sort of before we got on the air, what's changed is now we have people on the inside coming to us. Yeah. Recently, some of your stories, some of the best stories, um, came to you from insiders, from whistleblowers. And I recall there was one regarding Jeffrey Epstein. That's right. Can you uh, tell us about that, that story? That was one of our biggest stories ever and one of the first involving a whistleblower. So around 20, 2019, 2018, that thereabouts, people started to come to us in very low numbers. And one of these people, whose gender I will not reveal, worked for ABC News, owned by Disney Corporation. Mm -hmm. And this was in maybe October of 2019, and this person had recorded uh, a news anchor at Good Morning America, a woman named Amy Robach was her name, very pretty blonde morning host of ABC News, national. And she was on a commercial break, and she still had her microphone on, and she was talking aloud about Jeffrey Epstein. And she said, I had this story, this is her speaking on a commercial break, not on the air, saying that she had the story on Jeff Epstein, including a story on the Clintons and the British royal family, and she had the story for all this time, but ABC uh, squashed the story, spiked the story, to protect their relationship with the British royal family. The president of ABC News, a man named James Goldston, was close with Prince Andrew. Mm -hmm. And the Clintons, and she's talking about this, and she's saying, "I had all of it. I interviewed these witnesses. They wouldn't let me put it on the air." That, well, did she say, or did she just imply that there was a relationship between Prince Andrew and Jeffrey Epstein on that island and whatever? What she said was that uh, uh, she said she, she had, had a story. She had the story on the on the on the you know the the Clintons. She, to quote her, she said, "I had everything. Yeah. The Clintons." I had all of it three years ago, so that would have been 2016. And this it was very, it was, if you have not seen the video, it's it's one of the most watched Project Veritas videos because. By you, the way, you, 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 give us a plug. Where can we see these videos? Uh, Projectveritas.com. And you can go on the on the menu bar and scroll down through all the topics mm -hmm. and, and our YouTube channel. But Projectveritas.com, you can find them quickly. And I just want to speak about this video for another minute because. It, it, usually when you see these news anchors, they're sort of, they have this sort of act. They're sort of reading from the prompter. They're very primitive. But this woman was very compelling. This, this, is, this is the anchor for ABC News just criticizing who she works for. And, and you have you know, a video or audio of this? Both. Both. Video. Wow. And, and this woman, I mean, she's, she's captivating. She's pissed. She's she, very authentic. So... It really was another example of Epstein, the media, colluding the powers that be, and, and also the left, or mm. shall I say the non-right, loved that story. It was another example of an area where the left and the right overlap because they were upset. There were reports that came out that, that week saying, is James O'Keefe a journalist now? Because <laughs> <laughs> the moment I start telling stories that they don't you know, it's so horrible how that works out. They only they only call me a journalist when I expose things that they want also exposed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In any event, so that that was that was the beginning of a chapter of our journey that involved. So you made that uh, video public about her complaining that her boss had That's spiked the right. story. We, and what happened? We published this video, and then ABC News I mean, fire massive firestorm. ABC News puts out uh, uh, a statement. Um, uh, effectively, I don't remember the, exactly what they wrote, but a metaphorical gun to her head, if you will, and it reads like something out of a prison camp where they make the prisoner write the letter, and, and Amy Robach says, obviously written by an attorney, mm -hmm. 
um, says, you know, I, what did she say? I'm trying to remember the language she used. It was she, out of context. It was taken well, out of no, context. she 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 just said um, she kind of walked it back a little bit, and and then. Um, she said, uh, she, she said I, may, I shouldn't have said that. I, I said some things I didn't fully mean. It was written by a lawyer, obviously. And, and she probably, they prob I don't know, but they probably offered her some more money or something to keep an ape. So unfortunately for us, Amy Robeck is not a courageous human being because she didn't stand behind what she said. And I can't mention names, but there have been other people I've seen that were courageous. And when they were recorded like that, unwittingly, unwitting whistleblower, they 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 stood they 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 did not back down. Now, the person who recorded her, whose name I will not reveal to you, that person still works for ABC News to this day. Fantastic. So you could call Fantastic. him a Project Veritas source, undercover. Exactly, and not not one of the people I put there. <clears throat> right. But he is an <clears throat> actual employee. So so Disney Corporation, which is a children's company, mm -hmm. which is the irony of all this. They go through and, and go scorched earth campaign to try to find the identity of the leaker to me. They put people in rooms. I know this because the person inside Don't. is telling me. They interrogate them, et cetera, et cetera. And this person who's the source that gave me the video, whose name he would he, he or she, she would like to be referred to as Ignatus from mm -hmm. Harry Potter. They tried to find out who likes Harry Potter. <laughs> they, they, they want everything. And finally, they fire they fire someone they think is the, the source. Yeah. The wrong person. <laughs> and the person that they fired had just left ABC News to work for CBS News. This is a young woman. Uh, Ivy, I've actually, for, sitting here right now, I've forgotten her name. She was not my source. Just left ABC News. Days before I released the video... Um, and 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 oh. that person wasn't even the right person. So Megan Kelly interviewed her, and she said, "I've never talked to James O'Keefe in my life." So it, it was just extraordinary. And, and and this was like the the beginning of the Project Veritas model of whistleblowers. And then came the Pinterest guy, the software engineer at Pinterest, who who came to me, a very courageous young man, Eric Cochran. I don't was know his, the story. I don't recall the story. He he. <clears throat> blew the whistle on Pinterest. He had shown algorithms showing that they were censoring Bible verses. You couldn't type in and search for Bible verses on the Pinterest website. And they were they were they were labeling certain Christian websites as pornography in their algorithms. Which is kind of funny because you think of Pinterest, it's like a Hallmark greeting card. You 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 type in Bible verses. So he comes out with this information and um at first they 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 try to push back and then they double down. They they fired him and they completely banned all pro life content and some religious content. So that was the a turning point. This is in this is in um, summer of 2019 when I saw evil kind of it, everything doubled down. There was no more shame. Rather than be ashamed of being exposed, oh they doubled down. They said oh we're gonna ban it completely now. Whereas they were censoring it previously, yeah. they just banned it. And that was a, a turning point for sure. Now, do you have any way of rewarding um, uh, these whistleblowers? And I, you know, what about a contest? What about an award every year? It can be given anonymously or, or, or to them without uh, identifying who they are because some people lose their jobs over it. And I, I would think it'd be great to reward those people. Well, they do. They, well, a couple things. They, they do get rewarded vis-a-vis. -vis, they're often raising money after they go public and lose their job on a GoFundMe website. We don't use GoFundMe because they, they usually take our page down. Because again, misinformation, mm -hmm. whatever that okay, means. Okay, so they do get some. Sort but of but they've been raising uh, as much as half a million dollars when they when they Fantastic. go public. Fantastic. But what you don't want to do is work with a source who is doing it for that reason. Yeah. And that's why I've found, in my experience, that contests don't mm -hmm. work. Uh, what does work uh, is find people who want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. You find it's very rare, a form of human courage, mm -hmm. but they believe so strongly. And then they'll be rewarded. On, on well, how afterwards. about this though? How about uh, um, uh, telling people that if you're fired for for, for this, 
we will help pay your legal fees without saying how right. much you're going to pay. And something and like that. So, something to that is, effect. Uh, you know, I'd be willing to, to, to help fund that. Yes. And, and Veritas has, has created a whole cottage industry of people who do this now. I mean, mm-hmm. we do it almost once a month. Um, where some this last month there were two whistleblowers, one inside Health and Human Services, Jody O'Malley was her name, and she recorded uh, what was happening in the emergency rooms in in New Mexico and Arizona, where um, her clinic was. It was a, a Native American uh, federal clinic, and and they were hiding myocarditis conditions from the CDC. And she caught them on tape saying it. And, and these conditions they believe were due to the vaccine. They the due to the vaccine. vaccine. And they they were not reporting them to the CDC, even though they they have to, they're supposed to. Mm-hmm. Another whistleblower inside Pfizer Pharmaceutical. Regardless of what you think about the vaccine, this is an employee for Pfizer, mm-hmm. one of the most powerful companies in the world. Mm-hmm. And she had emails from their vice president and um, in Washington saying that they were trying to hide information from, from the people. So these are all whistleblower-driven stories. Mm-hmm. I would never have been able to get an undercover person no, no, in those at, at, at the vice president's office of Pfizer. <clears throat> so you mentioned you are helping them with legal fees. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, Melissa, and we're talking mm-hmm. in order of magnitude. Each of these people was, well, I think Jody raised $400,000, $500,000. Very good. Very good. So, And by the way, these are from small-dollar donors, $10, $20, $50 donors. So there's a huge group of people, patriots out there that are willing to support mm. these people. Wow. And how do they contagious. hear about it? How would they know to go to GoFundMe or the alternative site? How would they know that? Because how would I know we how to post do that? those links I see. to our ever expanding audience. You say, on, if you want to help, do this. I mean, our Telegram page, Dr. Brown, like this is this year. I was banned on Twitter uh, in April of 2021, 20, uh, this year, for doing a story on CNN. I had quoted Charlie Chester, the control room director, one of the CNN insiders we worked with, recorded Chester saying, you don't know this guy's name, but he's the control room director at CNN. And he's saying things like, we want to get Trump out. We help Biden. We're propaganda. So he was saying into the, he did not know he was being recorded. Mm -hmm. Twitter bans me. (laughs) That's how effective a story Mm -hmm. it was. You know, you got them when Mm -hmm. they censor you. Mm -hmm. And, our Telegram page, I don't know if you you guys know what Telegram is, but it's like Signal, it's an app, went from 4,000 people to 400,000 subscribers, like almost overnight. So our my point is Veritas's audience is, is growing. Great. In other words, people, we're building our own audience slowly but surely. So I post these Go, uh, Give, Send, Go, which is an alternative GoFundMe. I post those URLs on my I Telegram see. page. I see. To 400,000 people. And I don't know, 10, 20% of those people will donate. Mm-hmm. And and they're, and that's mm-hmm. growing. This is fantastic. And that's what the powers that be fear so much. Right. Because, well, well, shit, we can incarcerate him. We can threaten him with mm-hmm. dickhead New Hampshire. We can send, I don't know, people after him to make up stuff. We can sue him 20 times. We can, and he won't stop. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He won't give up. Mm-hmm. And, and if you think about it, you what, give up. what will make one, what, what does, I don't know existential on you here, but what does make a man stop? And the, and the truth is the only thing that can stop you is yourself. Mm-hmm. Well, most people stop. They're afraid. They're afraid of their reputation being ruined. They're afraid of being deplatformed. Um, uh, they're afraid of the IRS. And that's another question. Has the IRS attacked uh, um, Project Veritas yet? I yes. assume they will. I literally I have so many war stories. Um, yes, uh, not 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 just just the IRS. The um, uh, we're a nonprofit, so we're technically registered under the auspice of the Attorney General, Secretary of State's office. Mm-hmm. Nonprofits have to file a registration form in all fifty states. So there's thousands of pages of documents and compliance forms, and we, we have an army of lawyers and accountants that make sure every I is dotted mm-hmm, and every mm-hmm, T is crossed. Mm-hmm. But invariably, they'll try to foment an infraction. Oh, you forgot to check mark a box on page 197, form DI, mm-hmm. and it's just impossible. I know, I it's impossible to be perfect. <clears throat> so I think in one such form... Uh, this is way too long of a story, not worth getting into, but eight years ago, 
my accountant failed to check mark a box about the misdemeanor conviction because we didn't know if I was on the board. And because of that mistake, which he immediately corrected, they used that as justification to harass me in, in states like Utah and New York State. And it ended up costing like a million dollars in legal bills. This is what these people do. Yeah. Wear you down. They, try to they, wear they, you they down. try to wear you down by, by making you the target of their ire. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned a few words there in your in your analysis. Fear, 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 fear. Are you afraid of the IRS? Are you afraid of and I think the biggest fear that people have beyond the, the, the IRS, I think the biggest fear is the fear to be branded by Wikipedia and the fear of losing your Twitter account. Hmm. The fear of being disliked by the New York Times. A lot of conservatives will will criticize the New York Times, rightfully so, but deep down in places they don't want to admit, they don't want to be disliked by the New York Times mm. because they know intuitively that the New York Times has a lot of power, and they do. They set the agenda, they set the narrative, the algorithms prefer their news coverage. In fact, mm -hmm. most of these people on TV don't do any journalism, they just read the front page of the right. New York Times and right. talk about it. And, right. I, and I know this to be true because I see how it works on the internet. There's no journalism anymore, so the New York Times writes an article and that gets yeah. syndicated into Reuters and Associated Press and blogs. I, I, so, so they have so much power. And it's a power given to them mm. by the tech companies who don't do journalism themselves, but disseminate the New York Times and the Washington Post. Therefore, people are afraid to be criticized by them and to be branded by them. And that is, of all the fears, mm -hmm. the greatest fear that a man can have. Hmm. Only by people who respect the New York Times. But there are plenty of us who don't, who know from years back uh, that uh, that it's a highly biased uh, uh, organization. I, I, and, I know that you believe this, right. and I know that you believe this to be true, but most people, the vast majority, and I have found, it, they just don't... <laughs> the Republican Party is a great example of an organization, of a, of a body that still many of them fear. The New York Times. Being criticized. Being, okay. Being disliked, <clears throat> and I, I think that's true. So... That's probably but you the... are helping to change that, right? Yes. Because right now there are suits pending. Project Veritas versus the New York Times. So tell us about those suits. Well, in September of 2020, right before the presidential election, I did a story in Minnesota featuring a Somali man. Ah, yes, the voter fraud. Yes. Um, and this, this is fantastic. T t this guy was a Somali, a Somali American man living in Minneapolis. And if you don't know, Minneapolis is heavily Somali. Yep. Ilhan Omar's district is there. And um, we, 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 this is another whistleblower. Send us a video of this guy, Liban Muhammad, in his car with all these ballots. Yeah, if you haven't seen this video, this is just incredible. It's taken from the back seat of, I think maybe it's an Uber or somebody's car, and this Somali guy is speaking in English and in Somali about all the ballots that he's collected and how it's all about the money, and he doesn't mind lying about the, lying about the votes or anything. It is so blatant that you, you think it's fake, but it's not. But it wasn't. It looked like something on a South Park, like you say. So he recorded himself in this vehicle with ballots everywhere. And in Minnesota, it's illegal to harvest more than three. You can't even have, you can't have a bag of other people's ballots. It's against the law, it's a state crime. It's also a federal felony to, to accept payment, uh, to pay someone for their vote or to, so that's, that's another issue, that's a federal jurisdiction. So we have this video of all these ballots being harvested and he goes, I mean, literally in Somali broken English, you know, look at all these ballots. I got all these ballots. Another guy said, I'm paid $800 to vote. And the questioner said, well, that's illegal. And the Somali man says, I don't care illegal. $800 per vote. This is this on is, the video. This is on video. You could see their faces. You could hear their voices. This is not pretend. This is not, this is real recordings of crimes. So this is a big deal. Okay. Especially in a country where it's debating voter fraud. Now, 
I don't know if there was enough, how much fraud there was, but anecdotally, that was a felony caught on tape mm-hmm. in, in, in a place where that happens a lot. And, and and it was and it was proof that it was happening. And that was by whistleblower. That wasn't one of your people who rented that car or that Uber no, or whatever. That was <clears throat> Levon Muhammad had a Snapchat account. King Levon One mm-hmm. was his username. Yes. And he recorded himself. On himself. So how he did you only get that sent account, it though? Snapchat is thing where you only it's a private video. Yeah. So it's sent to a few people and one of his uh the people in the Somali community betrayed him <sighs> and, and and had captured the video. And sent it to us. Okay, now I get and it. And then we sent undercover porters on the ground to get more. So this comes out. This is a big story. I mean, this video, Veritas continues to outdo ourselves. This video was the number one trending story in the United States on Twitter. September. Even though you're banned from Twitter. Uh, this is pr- oh, just prior to the ban. Okay. September of 2020, I was banned April 21. I'm too eff- we're too effective. And we're a number one story, trending story on Twitter. And... Um, um, the, the, the New York times, a few hours later to my shock, I'm, I'm breaking the story comes out with a Trump tax return story, which is like number two or three on Twitter. So our story was beating the New, New York, York times. times' story, which the New York times would later say, which is rubbish that I was trying to compete with the Trump tax return story. I didn't even know the Trump tax return story was going to come out. Yeah. I, had, I had no bearing in my thinking. But this is what these people say. So the story comes out, and the New York Times writes an article Monday or Tuesday. This is the, this is the first presidential debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. And the article says, quote, Project Veritas video misleading, what experts call a coordinated disinformation campaign experts call yeah. and the subtitles the uh, the pullout quote said making claims without evidence now dr bob you didn't make any claims i, saw dr. Those bob, I didn't make any claims right and by the way all it was was evidence it was it was quite literally <laughs> a guy recording him. i mean and, and and they but but they use but they use unverified video first of all it's a, that's a, that's what we call. I'm a philosophy major. We call it tautology, mm-hmm. because because if you say it's unverified, what well, well, well you know, it's not going to be verified unless you try to go out and verify it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> unverified video, part of a disinformation campaign, coordinated, and the first sentence of the New York Times said deceptive video, disinformation. I mean, I I literally, I had seen some things in my life, but when that this is like an A section New York Times. This is on the front of the New York Times. And I literally, I was in an airport and it was a gut punch. And, you, and, and I know what you might think, well, the, you know, screw the New York Times, nobody cares. But they have so much power. Mm-hmm. I, can, mm-hmm. I can agree that they're corrupt and wrong. And also I can say they have power because that article came out and, and, and Facebook, which uses the New York Times as their fact checking mm-hmm. mechanism, mm-hmm. banned our video citing the New York Times article calling it disinformation. And Facebook Mm -hmm. is the vehicle by which tens of millions of people watched our video. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I sat down, I was in the airport in Phoenix, and I sat down and I had this sort of like Mm. Hitchcockian moment. I was like, I can't believe this. I'm living in 1984. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How can the New York Times say it's disinformation? Mm -hmm. On what grounds? Mm-hmm. And 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 all these people on the right, and I and I'm you, you'll hear me criticize people on the right, maybe even more than the left, because I need to shatter their illusions. Mm-hmm. We're going to go out and do surveys about voter fraud. Mm-hmm. If an incontrovertible video recording of a man committing a felony is no longer real, mm-hmm. then what makes you think anything else you're doing matters? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I do this, and I <clears throat> and I talk to my general counsel, and I say, Jared, I think we need to sue the shit out of him for defamation, hey, let's do it. So we file a lawsuit, New York court, for defamation, for calling our videos deceptive. And the, the lawsuit is successful. The lawsuit gets past motion to dismiss, which is very hard to do. I understand. Because I have to prove what's called actual malice under the law. I have to prove that the New York Times knew that it wasn't they deceptive. were lying. Yeah. And the judge in New York State mm-hmm. actually said in his order, he said, 
The New York Times' defense, by the way, their motion to dismiss said that it was just an opinion. I the see. New York Times said, well, that was all, that was our opinion, which is ridiculous because they're, it's, the, it's a news article. And the judge said, well, well the, 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 your, your honor, you know, the judge said, well, you're calling James O'Keefe deceptive disinformation, but what, what deception disinformation is you putting that in your article and calling it an opinion. What is, <laughs> what is that if not disinformation? Yeah. Oh, and by yeah. the way, Facebook utilized your quote unquote opinion right. as fact. As fact. Mm -hmm. So we could pass motion to dismiss. And now the New York Times is truly terrified mm -hmm. because I can depose them under oath. And if you put a bunch of New York Times reporters under oath in a video with a video camera, what do you think is going to happen? Mm -hmm. We're going to ask questions like, hey, did you call anyone for comment? No. Mm -hmm. Why not? Uh, basically, they're going to tell the truth. They're going to be think? forced to admit things. They're going to make them look yeah. very foolish. Yeah. And what did I tell you? The only thing they fear is being exposed. Please do put me in front of a deposition. Mm -hmm. I love being deposed. I, I you don't know mind why? Because I, I got nothing either. to hide. Right. I never mind a deposition. Just like this right now. They would never sit down and talk about this lawsuit. They can't. You know why? Because in the answer to our complaint after the motion to dismiss, they had to admit things. See, if you're not familiar with civil procedure, once you get past motion to dismiss in a lawsuit, they have to answer your questions. Mm -hmm. And in the answer, it's called an answer filed in response to our complaint, they were required by law to answer certain questions like, did you call anyone for comment? And they answered no. So how do you know it's disinformation? That's right. They had, to, they had to, are you an opinion columnist, Maggie Astor? No, I'm a news reporter. Oh, so then why did you say that it's an opinion? Mm -hmm. So they look foolish, see? It's one thing to look foolish in paper, it's another thing to look foolish yeah. in front of the camera. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I don't mean to jump around, but that's, that's this past week, the New York Times published my attorney client privilege documents right after the FBI raid. And the judge in New York State ordered them to, to, um, uh, to stop, to, to, to not do that because mm -hmm. we're suing each other. Hmm. And it's and it's attorney client privilege. There's attorney client privilege documents relating to this suit. Yes. How did they get those? I don't know. In fact, Benjamin Barr is of counsel to the defamation lawsuit against the New York Times. He's one of our lawyers in the embroiled in the New York Times litigation. So these documents, nothing in them I'm ashamed of, but it's the principle of the matter. Yeah. The New York Times is 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 asking the court to stay discovery to prevent me from deposing them until the court of appeals court of appeals hear, rehears the motion to dismiss all the while publishing my privileged communications so why can't i publish their privileged communications what's preventing us from deposing them so th this is before the court right now and again the, the new york times keeps printing hit piece after hit piece against uh, against us um, probably because they fear us and they fear what we're capable of. Mm -hmm. Well, good luck in that suit, really. Best of luck in that suit. I'm glad it uh, it survived uh, the dismissal. The uh, the tried uh, and I think and I think they're scared of that. I think <clears throat> they're they're fearful of that. You know, another story that's happening almost as we speak. Earlier this month, uh, two of your associates where uh, uh, their offices or their homes were uh, invaded by the FBI. They were searched. I don't know all the details. And then two days after that, your house, your apartment, came under investigation by the FBI. Uh, and that made a lot of news. Tell us more about it. How? Uh, what were they looking? First of all, how did it happen? Your way, uh, did, they, did they show up in black, black cars? What happens? Well, I heard a, a pounding on my door at, at 6 a.m. Um, and you expected probably this to happen because your two associates had it not, happen. Not fully. I mean, the, the two associates were, um, were, were Spencer and Eric Cochran, and they had left Veritas over the summer uh, some two, three, four months ago. So I, I, I wasn't sure what to expect. I'd recorded a statement um, the day before uh, they came to my house and I released the statement and I talked about all the facts of what happened because we're just journalists. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're just doing our job. Sources come to us with information. Sometimes we publish it and sometimes we don't. Mm -hmm. And in this case, a source came to Project Veritas 
with something that they purported yeah, tipsters to, to be. came uh, to us with this the diary, the diary of uh, Biden's uh, and, and, Ashley. And I couldn't authenticate. <clears throat> I couldn't authenticate it fully that it was that it was. Uh, that it was hers. I mean, I was fairly sure it was hers, but not a hundred percent. So I couldn't authenticate it. And I, and I couldn't verify if the contents of the diary actually occurred. You know, she talked about things, uh, um, you know, showers with her dad. I, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't, I didn't, I just, I just also too felt like even if I could authenticate, I couldn't authenticate if, if the stuff that she talked about was real. And I also feel like on a certain level and they, maybe people will disagree with me, but I just feel like there are certain private parts of people's lives that don't really, the public doesn't have a right to know. I just felt it wasn't for public viewing. It wasn't newsworthy. So I couldn't authenticate any, most of the stuff. So I'd made the decision not to publish it. Now, and, and gave uh, it know, back. so, so yeah. an individual came to you. Did he try to sell it to you? Give us more into, uh, detail about that individual. Well, there's. Without, without disclosing anything confidential. Well, I mean, I, I. I don't want to get into all the very specifics because, you know, this is an ongoing matter. We did nothing wrong. But these source, these tipsters came to us mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we, we, we purchased the rights to, to publish this, this, this piece of information. But from had, them. From them. Yeah. And we had engaged in negotiations with the, they had lawyers that were representing them. Oh. Um, and we had to go about trying to corroborate that this was actually hers. Um, did they say how they got it? Could you tell us that? They did. I did mention that, and they did say that to us, that it was abandoned, it was left, is what they communicated to us. And and now there's reports that it was stolen. We we I was not aware of that. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't know if it was. We don't know if it was. But even if it was, which we don't know, we're protected as journalists under the, under the uh, a Supreme Court case called Bartnicki v. Vopper. The law of the United States is... If someone gives information to you, a document or something, and that document was stolen by the third party and you played no part in that, then you have a right to report what's in that document mm -hmm. as long as you played no part in it. Mm -hmm. So even if, which I don't know if it was right. stolen, but even, if, it even if they lied to me right. and said, and they and they did steal it or they or the other guy that gave it to him, whoever stole it, and I didn't wasn't involved in that. You have the right to it. I have the right to do it. So. This is a protected, codified part part of journalism. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so before we get to the raid, I mean, I did the most. I I really believe we behaved so ethically and so responsibly. What more could we have done? And what did you do with it? You did take possession of it, and you gave, gave it, it back, back to, back to well, the we, police. Well, we we tried to give it back to um uh we, we tried we we contacted her? yeah, and her lawyer wouldn't authenticate it, so we decided to. Uh, you know, give it to the police so that it can be back to its rightful owner because we didn't know who it actually right. belonged to. Right. So my point, <laughs> my point here is, what more could a, a responsible, yeah, person, journalist, not even a journalist, person, what, what, what more could someone do? And if the answer is nothing, I mean, I mean, think of it for a minute. What, what should someone do mm -hmm. in that circumstance? Someone gives you some a document, okay. All right, I'm looking into this. All right, well, you know, I'm not certain about this. I don't think I should publish it. For we tried to do the right thing, right? And 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 again, this is a very important question. What more could I have done? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is nothing, well, that's that's troubling, isn't it? Because because now what they're doing is they come to my house. Okay. Right. And they bang on the door and they have a search warrant. And how many? How many? This is not. They didn't just call you and say, James, we. This is a federal prosecutor, so and so. We'd like you to come down to the courthouse and talk to us about this. They actually come to your house with guns. They come to my house with guns and FBI jackets, and mm -hmm. they banged on the door. There were ten agents, and I was, um, I was uh, asleep at six a.m. on a Saturday, mm -hmm. and uh, I woke up. I was in sort of my underwear. And it was very dark. It was. This is on the East Coast this time of year. It's very, very pitch, pitch black. Yep. Yep. And just a few weeks ago. They're pounding on the door. November, November fifth, I believe the day was, uh, six a.m. And my first thought is, I got to get to that door because I don't want them to break the door down. Right. Because you'll be responsible. Because <laughs> I got to fix the door. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you think of all the things you're worried about, but I guess that was what was going through my mind. Um. And um. You know, they were screaming, um, hollering, open the door, you know, something like that. And um, I went to open the door and there was, there was, you know, 10 agents and they had bright lights and 
blue FBI jackets and I couldn't see because there were so many lights and then they handcuffed me and, and threw me against the wall in the hallway of my apartment building. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I, at, at first I, I asked, I'd like to speak to my attorney. Um, eventually they let me do that. They, they, I made the phone call from my iPhone that they had a search warrant to seize. And as soon as I was done leaving a voicemail or a phone call to my lawyer, they snatched the phone from me, giving them access to the contents of my phone because it was unlocked from the call that I had just made. So that, that's how they were able to get into, into the phone and perhaps they changed the settings so that it wouldn't go, go black. Um, so this happened and it was a grave violation of my constitutional rights because I'm a journalist. And the, the search warrant uh, that, that, they, uh, that they showed me listed uh, a series of, of crimes that they, they didn't accuse me of these crimes, but the search warrant, and I don't remember the exact language, but it was like either you know you have information pertaining to these crimes, so mm -hmm. someone else could have committed. Mm -hmm. But these crimes were accessory after the fact, mm -hmm. misprison of a felony and transporting stolen property across state lines. So to, to, to mind you the absurdity of, these, of, of this, if a New York Times reporter or Washington Post reporter receives a document from inside, I don't know, national security do document or anything, and transports that document across state, or emails that document across state lines, they could be charged with these crimes mm -hmm. give, if someone gave them that document. So, so, so they would never be raided by the yeah. feds. Yeah. So the government's position here, mm -hmm. I guess, in, in, at least in some of the documents they filed, is that I'm not a journalist. I'm not a journalist because I don't get permission from the people I report on, which is an absurd. Yeah, uh, is there such a thing as a it's journalist um, ID card? It's, that it's, says it's 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 illogical and so preposterous that even the ACLU and Reporters Committee for Free Press this was unbelievable have come to my defense because the arguments the government is making in this case are are, are so they're so preposterous, Doctor Bob that. It, 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 they're actually suggesting that you need permission. I'm not even talking about surreptitious. For, forget the hidden camera. They're saying that you need permission from the people you report on in order to be a journalist, which even the New York Times, they're, they're thinking, whoa, wait a second. We don't get permission from the people we report on. So this issue is so fundamental. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the Rubicon that they have, the bridge that they've crossed here is so beyond the pale that 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 Ben Smith at the New York Times came out. This is a week after the raid or so, and said, "Hey guys, I don't think we should be cheerleading this." I guess yeah, James. I'm going to read something. Yeah, uh, please do right now. <clears throat> the actions that uh, James just told you about were so egregious that even the leftist ACLU, which are no friends of James or Project Veritas issued a statement in response to the FBI's raid on his home on November 14th. And I'm going to read you this. This was written by Ben Haas, the senior staff attorney with ACLU's Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project. Here's what he said. Project Veritas has engaged in disgraceful deceptions and reasonable observers might not consider their activities to be journalism at all. That's how they start, okay? They hate Project Veritas, they hate James O'Keefe. Nevertheless, the precedent set in this case could have serious consequences for press freedom unless the government has good reason to believe that Project Veritas employees were directly involved in the criminal theft of the diary, it should not have subjugated them to invasive searches and seizures. We urge the court to appoint a special master to ensure that law enforcement officers review only those materials that were lawfully seized and that are directly relevant to, the, to a legitimate criminal investigation. So even you know the way they open, uh, he is engaged in disgraceful deceptions. They're not even talking about this case. They're just saying, we hate James O'Keefe, right? Yeah. Nevertheless... The FBI is wrong, according to them, and uh, this is the ACLU speaking. So this is way beyond the pale, and Americans, not just uh, journalists, 
are potentially losing their rights of freedom of speech. Um, and that'll be enforced by the FBI coming to your door. If they come to his door, yeah. they can come to your door. That's that's very prophetic. If they can do it to me, they can do it to you. That's right. And and call it self-interest, which is maybe what that you know statement is. That mm -hmm. was an extraordinary moment for me because I've been doing this you know my my whole life. And God, it's been since two thousand nine the, the the Acorn story. I hadn't seen that level of support, and I, and what that showed me was there still is a tiny f sliver of overlap, a Venn diagram between the left and the right in this country. Hmm. There still are things that we do fundamentally agree on. Call it self-interest. Call mm -hmm. it mutually assured destruction. They don't want a, you know, a Trump right. presidency to derade their homes. But there is something very unsettling, even to people, you know, ev to everyone except the 2% of mm -hmm. Americans who, you know, maybe who are too extreme. There's something deeply unsettling about about someone who exists for the purpose of informing the people. Maybe you don't like him, maybe you don't like his hidden camera stuff, or you or you Very buy this ridiculous important. argument that we edit tapes improperly, which is not true, but maybe you believe that. There's still something unsettling to taking a battering ram to his door, handcuffing him when he's almost naked, taking his phones, and and then leaking. And I mean, I'll tell you what, right after the raid, I got a message from the New York Times. Yeah, how would that happen? Right after. Right now, you could submit. Well, maybe a neighbor tipped them off. Maybe, but that wouldn't explain. That would not explain how the New York Times reporter knew about the the contents of the search warrant, mm -hmm. including the diary. How did they know? How did they know these facts? The FBI told them. Someone at the FBI so, told them. So, so that so something very unusual happened. That's right. It, it, it was very unusual. And uh, it was terrifying. Is it over or is there a next step? So what happened was the ACLU mentioned the special master. And right now the federal judge in New York, um, a federal judge has ordered the FBI to stop going through my phone. Uh, and there is on the judge's desk the decision of to whether to appoint what's called a special master, which mm -hmm. is a person who... I guess, and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm speaking, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to explain this concept. There's an outside party that supervises this process to make sure that they only look at materials on my phone directly related to the diary thing. Yeah, but but I don't understand. Why would the FBI involve, be involved in the theft of a diary? That's a great question. I'm not. They're not involved in investigating Antifa for fomenting These violence are... in the streets. These Is are questions why? which don't have answers, my friend. These are questions that are rhetorical in nature, and and Greg Jarrett on Fox asked the same question: on in what world is is the FBI investigating? And a as diary? you know, the FBI is is being urged by uh, the attorney general to investigate parents who show up at school board meetings because they're potentially uh, domestic terrorists. Right. So the FBI is being used by the right wing, by the by the left well, wing, by the Obama administration to be the jackboot of... I think there are different issues in society. Let's call it, you know, ed education. These are hot button things, guns. I mean, there was the, the Rittenhouse trial... You know the the, the right of self defense. There, 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 are people. Americans are divided, but when it comes to the First Amendment, it, it, this is the most sacred, most fundamental thing that we still mostly mm -hmm. agree on. I would say majority of people still agree that journalism is a right. That journalism is important. In fact, I would submit to you that 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 the, the notion of good journal. I'm talking about real journalism. That most people think that. Journalists should have a right not to have their notebook seized by federal agents just because they don't like what they're doing. That is less controversial statement than, you know, I don't know the right to homeschool your kids or the right to own an AR-15. And, and I happen to believe in those rights, as any American should. But this is something even more fundamental. Mm -hmm. The public's right to know in a, in a republic the public's right to have access to and information. And you have no recourse based on this? I mean, they they they, they, they didn't arrest you. They didn't... No, they haven't they, charged you with They anything. didn't charge you with anything. They could. They could indict me. Um, 
uh, on on what I don't understand. On on ex- they didn't take you downtown. They didn't fingerprint you. No, no, they handcuffed me. And they. And and why they, do they even do that if you're searching I don't a home? Know. Is that standard procedure when I don't you know. do a when you do a search warrant to to handcuff the individuals? I don't know. And there are certain things because I'm I'm on the record here. There are certain things I I, I can't get into because it would violate my okay. own. Fine. And, and I won't. But I'm just, I just I just want to say this. There are certain things I can't discuss. Plans, strategies, things I intend to do because it would violate my own privilege, my own attorney-client privilege. So I won't do that. But I can talk about what's what's on the matter of the public record and what's already occurred. And this judge has to decide on, um, you know, on whether to appoint a special master on this You can't case. get compensation with this kind of thing? We'll see. see. Okay, we'll see. But but the issue before the court, the, the, the one of the things in the publicly filed motion of the government was they're arguing I'm not a journalist. That's what they're arguing. The Attorney General, the Attorney General of the United States wrote a, wrote a memo in July strictly forbidding the sort of actions that were taken against me, mm-hmm. journalists' notes and phones and, and things. Mm-hmm. There, there are rules and regulations. So they'll just, they'll just say you're not a journalist? They'll just say that anybody doing, apparently the modus operandi is anybody mm-hmm. doing journalism, they'll say, well, he's not a journalist. No, anybody doing journalism, writing or investigating what they don't want written so or investigated. So doesn't that is remind you of Animal Farm? Well, yeah, it's pretty The, the, pretty the close. Orwell quote that all animals are equal, Except but some, some are, are more equal, equal than, than others. Than others. It's, it's a logical absurdity. <clears throat> And, and if there's any semblance of law and, and justice in this country, I mean, this case is so important. My, the case of what I'm currently going through, and I am going through it right now. I'm speaking to you on the record about this. Some people say, well, he must be crazy for speaking. Well, I'm, I'm speaking about unassailable facts. Right. I'm speaking, I'm quoting legal documents. But that's why this case is so important. And that's why the ACLU came to my defense, for the reasons I've just listed. Okay. Well... In the early 1900s, President Theodore Roosevelt coined the term muckrakers for those reform-minded journalists who search for and try to expose corruption, scandal, or wrongdoing, especially in politics. In a speech in 1906, he said, quote, It is very necessary that we should not flinch from seeing what is vile and debasing. There is filth on the floor, and it must be scraped up with the muck rake. And there are times and places where this service is the most needed of all services that can be performed. James, you recognize that now is the time, and your associates are performing that very valuable service. I want to thank you for joining me tonight, spending time with me, and thank you so much more for the extremely valuable and and sometimes dangerous work that you do to uncover the wrongdoings, the muck that is hidden from our view with the goal of making America a better place for all of us. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Life Lessons with Dr. Bob. If you enjoy these interviews with some of today's most influential thought leaders, please follow and rate the show on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget, you can also watch each episode on YouTube as well. We'll see you next time. 